Hello, my name is Graham Griffiths. I work at City University of London, where after many years uh, lecturing and teaching, I am now a research fellow. I'm very happy to be invited to talk about the current subject of my research, who is a composer, a female composer, a female Russian composer called Leokadia Kasperova. And the reason that I uh, have taken such an interest in Kasperova is because I came across her name through my previous research, which was a 10 year project uh, researching the music of Stravinsky, Igor Stravinsky, who is considered to be the greatest 20th century composer, uh, also Russian. And uh, one of the interesting features of Stravinsky's life is that very little was known about uh, his early years spent in St. Petersburg. Um, he himself talked very little about it. He really didn't want to talk about it. He didn't give it much importance, but we all know how important childhood is. And in fact, he was there living in St. Petersburg uh, until his 20s, his mid-20s. So it was not just his childhood, uh, his formative years. Uh, until early adulthood were spent in St. Petersburg where he received education like everybody else. But the question that interested me was what was his musical education and all that really emerged uh, during Stravinsky's life and he died in 1971, all that he really was prepared to talk about uh, and even that very little was his composition teacher, the great Russian composer Rimsky-Korsakov um, who taught him privately on Wednesday evenings for many years in Rimsky's apartment, which I visited. That was all Stravinsky was prepared to talk about, and the rest of his education, he uh, he would outspokenly said he didn't value, and really he sent everyone to hell, <laughs> rather unpleasantly, but that's what it was. He felt, obviously, very strongly about a desire not to talk about anybody else. And for an academic, that's an invitation, isn't it? You're always looking to find something that has not been written about. That's what your life is. You can't just keep on repeating what everyone else has said. Your whole justification in your role at university is to be individual uh, and to bring new information to, the, to your field. In, in my case, music, musicology. So when I eventually finished uh, my research and published my book uh, with Cambridge University Press. My book Stravinsky's Piano was published in 2013. When that uh, arrived, I could um, I could breathe. But for 10 years, I worked every single day, every single weekend, without stopping. So you can imagine after 10 years, I really felt like drawing a breath and saying, what now? And my instinct was to return to the beginning of my research and look at the um, musical education that, that Stravinsky received because he became uh, from the age of 40 plus uh, not only uh, the composer world famous as he was but he became uh, a concert pianist of his own music and as a pianist myself uh, it was a mystery to me how he could have suddenly really over the space of eight, eight months, in fact, transformed himself into a concert pianist. I mean, you, could, you can't do that unless you have been very well uh, educated and trained. Um, therefore, who trained him? Where did he learn these skills? Uh, because he certainly didn't talk about them. In his autobiography, published in 1936, he mentions his piano teacher, but not by name. Uh, he firstly uh, condemns her as being uh, old-fashioned and he just paints her with a broad brush, the broad brush that he condemns everybody, as I mentioned before, condemns everybody there in St. Petersburg. But having criticised her, he stops and says, I must admit that I owe my piano technique to her and my sense of métier. That is my sense of profession and the profession of concert pianist 
is what he's referring to. And I think more than that, he's referring to the profession, the double profession of concert pianist and composer. Not easy to, main, to maintain either profession, but to maintain them both simultaneously was uh, an incredible métier. And uh, he credits her, although he doesn't mention her by name, he credits this piano teacher person with giving him his piano technique uh, and uh, the sense of the double profession that he eventually acquired in his 40s. Uh, therefore, it was interesting for me on the search for an individual uh, project, a new project, for me to go to Russia personally uh, in search of Stravinsky's piano teacher. And I found um, two things. Initially, I found that nobody had heard about her at all for a hundred years. They couldn't even mention her name. Nobody had even heard of her. And the second thing I found was that the few pieces of music by her I found were of the extremely high quality. Now, normally in music, in musical history, I'll just explain, musical history is a waste ground of forgotten composers. For all the composers you name, the famous one, Bach, Handel, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, uh, Schumann, Wagner, Brahms, Stravinsky, there's nine they have mentioned. Well, they are, if you like, they represent nine generations of humanity. For every generation in humanity, where there are hundreds of thousands of composers all over the world, there might be one who actually survives the, um, the passage of time because their music is so extraordinarily good. So there have been, in the last hundred years, an enormous number of composers who've lived and died and been forgotten because their music isn't very good, or it might be reasonable, but it's certainly not of lasting quality. Um, and within Russia, which is such an extraordinarily musical country, there are thousands of composers who have lived and died and been forgotten uh, not because they are, uh, music is bad, but simply because it's not of that utterly extraordinarily original level that will enable their music to survive and be of interest to future generations. So when I arrived in Russia and began very slowly to piece together the details of uh, this composer's life, remember her name is Leokadia Kasperova, um, I began to find one by one individual compositions. I was astonished by the, the great quality of this music to such an extent that I brought some of these scores back with me to, to Britain and I continued to research them and put together information without really quite knowing where this would lead me. And nobody in Russia knew about her. I talked to uh, one or two librarians and archivists, people without any public profile whatsoever about her, and they were curious that this uh, Brit was in Russia uh, on some sort of personal trail or some sort of personal pilgrimage or other linked to Stravinsky vaguely, you know. Nobody didn't make any impact there. And here, similarly, nothing was really happening. I did eventually have an invitation from a school called Come the House School in Sussex, in the middle of Sussex. They invited me to deliver a concert. And I said, well, could I, could I give a lecture recital about my travels in Russia? That could be interesting. And it was, it was very well attended. And I talked about my um, travels in Russia in search of Leo Kadja Kasperova. And I finished it by performing at the piano uh, her major piano work, which is called In the Midst of Nature, which is a series of delightful and lovely and very dashing portraits of Russia and the Russian countryside and so forth. The, um, the patterns of the harvest, um, the, the, the flowers, the autumn leaves and things like that, the murmuring of the rye, the thrashing of the wheat, these images of rural life uh, displayed musically, pictorially, through musical sound. And at the end of the performance, something happened that is very, very unusual in this dear country of ours, extremely unusual. There was a standing ovation. Now, I've been to concerts 
given by some great, great, great artists. I'm thinking particularly of Yehudi Menuhin, the great violinist, one of the greatest violinists, and a great diplomat for, for world peace through music. I've been to several of his recitals and concerts. Never, uh, not even at one of those, was he given a standing ovation. But I received a standing ovation. Now, not because of me, but because of the great interest the public took uh, in the music of, uh, and the life of Leo Kadja Kashbereva. And um, as soon as I finished the last note, and everybody leapt to their feet. It's something I've never seen in Britain. You, you see this in Latin America, for example, all the time. In Brazil, where I lived many years, every single concert ends with a standing ovation. It's like normal, because the audience loves that special sense of excitement about it. But not in Britain. You don't get standing ovation at all. And there I was, standing at the front of the stage, waving Kasperova's musical score in the air, and people cheering and, and clapping and on their feet, stamping their, stamping their feet. And um, it was an extraordinary event. And it, and it showed me something uh, that was very important. It was proof to me that my judgment was correct. Her music is of the highest quality. And people will love it. And people do love it when they hear it. Um, and after that, I began to invest more and more of my time in... Um, putting Kashbirov's music out there so that people could hear it for themselves. It wasn't just um, my pet academic project anymore. I felt a responsibility, um, a bit like a father does when uh, your child is precociously gifted in sport, for example, or in, or in, or in music. You feel a responsibility to, to assist that child to get out there and, and deliver their best and, and to share that talent with, with the world. And that was really what I learned from that experience because a week later a week later I was invited to go to the BBC and to deliver a presentation about Kashbereva to the to a, to a group of I think it was about 60 BBC producers who come, who had come from all over the UK and we met in the Senate room I think they call it the the, the major and most prestigious meeting room uh, of the BBC and I was given basically 10 minutes to talk about Kashmirova. At the end of my talk um, it came to the Q&A, the questions and answers, and the microphone was passed to uh, the a gentleman on the front who wasn't a BBC producer. He was um, the chief executive officer of Boozy and Hawks music publishers, who published the music of Stravinsky. And he took the microphone and he said, I, I, I just want to say one thing. Um, I was at the concert last week at that school. I was in the audience. I was part of the standing ovation. And this music by Kashmirova is too good. And this is an immortal phrase. It will go down in music history as one of the great, great phrases of musical history. He said, this music of Kashmirova is too good to remain in biscuit tins under Graham's bed any longer. And um, as I speak to you today, uh, I have been recently appointed the general editor of the Kashberova edition published by Boozy and Hawks. And so I'm enormously grateful to Boozy and Hawks, which is a worldwide music publishing house uh, specialized, if you like, in Russian music, to have given Kashberova a home uh, forever. Uh, they are publishing uh, her scores this year and into the future. I'm bringing scores from Russia, editing them, preparing them for publication, so that you at home can access her music, either yourselves by performing them, uh, performing her music, or by hearing performances of her music through other musicians, through concerts and, and recordings on, on the radio and so forth like that. So, um, I'm well down the path uh, in, in a completely unexpected and brilliant way that a few years ago there was I plodding the streets of St. Petersburg on my own, wearing out pairs of shoes on those granite paving stones uh, that are so famous and so very hard. Um, here I am uh, able to say that Kasperova's music has a publisher and her music will be published from now on and hopefully orchestras and singers and pianists and cellists all around the world will 
uh, choose her music and uh, give it a go and discover, as I discovered, and as that audience has discovered uh, through Radio 3 already, that her music is utterly brilliant and very, very beautiful.